Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming to our first of three First Bell Lectures here in the spring semester of ACCIER 2022. Uh, this semester, the First Bell Lectures are again brought to you by the Forum on Integrated Naval History and Sea Power Studies, which is uh, hosted by the History Department here at the Naval Academy, as well as the Stockdale Center. I'll take this off so the mic picks me up better. The Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, who's our partner in these lectures. Um, today, uh, we're going to rewind our history all the way back to the founding era of the United States Navy. And so our speaker today is Dr. Tom Shepard from Marine Corps University. And his talk today is going to be entitled, To Rid the Navy of Such Men, Benjamin Stoddart and the Creation of the Navy Department. Uh, Dr. Thomas Shefford is an assistant professor at the Marine Corps University's Command and Staff College and the author of the new book, Commanding Petty Despots, The American Navy in the New Republic. He earned his doctorate in 2014 at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where his research focused on civil relations in the early American era. Prior to joining Marine Corps University in 2021, he worked at the Naval History and Heritage Command where his projects included the documentary history of the U.S. Navy in World War I and a featured article on the Navy's response to the influenza pandemic in 1918. So without further ado, Dr. Shepard. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. So um, as the, the title of the talk would indicate, the focus of our conversation today is going to be on Benjamin Stoddart. Benjamin Stoddart was the first Secretary of the Navy in the United States. He served in that post from 1798 to 1801. And in many ways, uh, Stoddart faced one of the most daunting tasks of anyone to hold that post. Uh, Stoddart took over a Navy department without much of a Navy. So by the end of the Revolutionary War, the United States was down to just two ships. It sold off both of those ships to make a small dent in the war debts that it accumulated. And for about a decade after securing independence, the United States did without a naval force. In 1794, Congress finally voted to create a United States Navy, but it only authorized the construction of six frigates. And by the time Stoddart took office, only three of those frigates had actually been completed. Now, there were also a slew of merchant ships and commercial vessels of varying size and varying quality that uh, the United States had hastily refitted and armed as, as naval vessels. But Stoddart still faced the problem of building an officer corps from scratch. He had almost no naval officers to work with. And from his first day on the job, he had a very clear conception in mind of the kinds of naval officers that the New Republic needed. He wrote early in his tenure, officers of zeal and spirit might be able to make up for want of great force by great activity. And later he explained to President John Adams, our Navy at this time when its character is to form ought to be commanded by men who, not satisfied with escaping censure, will be unhappy if they do not receive and merit praise. And if such men of zeal and spirit could not be found, well, then we had better burn our ships and commence a navy at some future time when our citizens have more spirit. Now Stoddart believed there were enough of the kind of leaders America needed to build a successful navy, but he also recognized that one of his main duties as head of the Navy Department was going to be purging the unfit from the officer corps. He insisted that the country had better have no Navy than have it commanded by indifferent men, and it shall be my study to rid the service of such men. Stoddart's idea of the qualities that the United States needed in its first generation officer corps were based on international realities. The United States was a new nation, the United States was a relatively weak nation, and the United States was not looked on with uh, any kind of respect by the major powers of Europe, especially Britain and France. Britain and France were at war at the time, uh, and they saw the United States as a pawn in their great power games. They did not see the United States as a nation that they would have to take 
its interests or its wishes into account in their policies. And Stoddart understood that the Navy performed before an international audience with the country's reputation on the line. The Navy existed in large part to earn respect for the infant republic. That's why Stoddart emphasized so heavily a keen sense of honor in the first generation of naval officers. This was obviously a time period when honor was at the forefront of, uh, of most people's minds anyway, but Stoddart especially cultivated that idea in his naval officers. Uh, he wanted officers who would not allow the slightest insult to their country, and he removed any officer who did allow even the slightest insult to the country, while he would also tolerate pretty blatant insubordination from officers who displayed his, tries, his prized traits of industriousness, sensitivity to honor, and aggressiveness in the face of combat. But that mentality also came at a cost. Uh, zealous officers with a hypersensitive sense of honor tended to fight with each other and fight with the Navy Department as much as they fought with the enemy. And for Stoddart, some of his greatest headaches came from officers who most displayed the, the character traits that he prized. The other reality for Stoddart as he took office is that he was taking over the Navy Department in the midst of a war. Uh, having contributed a great deal to America's uh, victory over Britain in the War for Independence, in fact, war, victory in the War for Independence would have been impossible without France's aid. And so the French naturally expected the United States to come to their aid when they went to war with Britain as a result of the French Revolution. And the French government was furious when the United States instead declared itself neutral. But not only declared itself neutral, the United States maintained a thriving commercial trade with Great Britain, this country that they had been at war with just a few years prior, they were now getting wealthy off of, and in the process supplying Britain with its, uh, with its needs to continue its war effort against France. And so France retaliated by authorizing privateers to prey on American commercial shipping. So privateers were, as the name would indicate, private ships, ships uh, under civilian ownership that were authorized by the government to arm themselves and to seize merchant shipping from a particular country, in this case the United States, and uh, thereby indirectly make war against that country's commerce. Now, neither France or the United States, for a variety of reasons, wanted to take the step of officially declaring war. Um, and so, for that reason, this conflict has come down in history as it's sometimes called the Half War, but more often it's known as the Quasi War. And the Quasi War prompted a massive expansion in the U.S. Naval Officer Corps. Historian Christopher McKee estimates that the Corps under Stoddart ballooned from only three captains to over 700 officers between 1797 and 1801, the years the United States was engaged in conflict with France. And the burden for choosing these officers largely fell on Stoddart. There were two ways he could select the officers he wanted. Uh, one was to look through the applications and select the officers himself to personally name naval officers. And practical seamanship counted for surprisingly little in Stoddart's mind in choosing naval officers. Several men were awarded midshipmen's commissions without ever having been on a ship, or for that matter, without ever having seen the ocean. Uh, the main things he looked for were credentials as men of integrity, men of high social standing, and above all, men of industriousness. Men of energy should be selected for our naval officers, he wrote to one correspondent adding that the usefulness and honor of our Navy depend upon the men selected as officers. He wanted men who were industrious, but also he wanted men who displayed staunch physical courage. He commented to Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton that captains should possess real bravery, adding that bravery is a quality not to be dispensed with in officers. Like charity, it covers a great many defects. Still, given the need to rapidly build up the officer corps, it was simply impossible for Stoddart to personally choose every single, uh, every single officer who was commissioned himself. And so in terms of delegating that responsibility, he leaned heavily on the most senior officers already in the Navy. Stoddart looked to captains to select good candidates for midshipmen, 
and he looked to captains to select good candidates for promotion among the midshipmen and lieutenants. Uh, in a typical letter, he wrote to one captain, I wish you would select and nominate to me suitable characters for your officers, stipulating that only men of courage, abilities, and patriotism, and such men only, be added to the ranks of our infant navy. Now, officially, when a captain appointed a junior officer, that had to be confirmed later, but in practice, Stoddart rubber-stamped uh, any commissions that were handed out by his officer corps. Um, but in addition to choosing officers, Stoddart also looked to his captains to rid the service of officers. He considered one of his captain's foremost duties to be compelling undeserving subordinates to resign. But uh, some never had the option of resigning. So for example, on November 16, 1798, uh, Captain Isaac Phillips was cruising off Havana in the, uh, in the Baltimore, and he encountered a Royal Navy squadron. The squadron was under command of a British officer named Captain John Loring. John Loring was actually born in the United States during the colonial era. He had been a loyalist during the American Revolution. Uh, he obviously took a dim view of the United States, and he put that dim view on display for Captain, uh, Captain Phillips on this date. He sent a messenger over to Captain Phillips' ship, asked Phillips to come over and meet with him on his flagship, the Carnatic. And at the time, the United States was technically at peace with Great Britain. It was commonplace for ships of different navies to, uh, to carry mail packets for other countries if the countries were at peace. And so most likely, Phillips assumed that was what he was going to be doing aboard the Carnatic. He allowed the, uh, the British to row him over to the ship. And when he got there, uh, Loring informed him that the Carnatic was short of men and he was going to be boarding the Baltimore and he was going to be seizing the seamen that he needed for, uh, for his own ship. Phillips protested, but Phillips also had one ship versus an entire Royal Navy squadron and so in his mind there, he really didn't have much option. And he, uh, he meekly returned to his own ship. He obeyed British orders to assemble his crew. He obeyed British orders to hand over his muster roll, and he stood by and watched in dismay as Loring's men carried off 55 of his own sailors. When Stoddart read Isaac Phillips' report, he exploded. Stoddart was furious at what Phillips had done. It is impossible to find an excuse for your tame submission to the orders of a British lieutenant on board your own ship, Stoddart wrote to Phillips. It's bad enough that you failed to put up any kind of defense against being boarded, but you descended further and actually obeyed orders to have all hands called and give him a list of their names. For such degrading conduct, Adams and Stoddart summarily dismissed Phillips from the Navy and revoked his commission as an officer. Uh, Phillips sent a spirited letter in his own defense explaining about, oh, the, you know, the odds were stacked against me. There was a whole squadron of them. There was only one ship on mine. It was a hopeless fight, but Stoddard would hear none of it. Uh, Phillips should have put up a fight, and after being overwhelmed, he should have surrendered his sword and surrendered his ship. Uh, and instead of simply meekly obeying the orders of another nation's officers. The example made out of Phillips apparently had a salutary effect. When a British officer came aboard the Ganges in February of the following year, Captain Thomas Tingey boldly informed him that he would not muster his crew as he considered all my crew Americans by birth or adoption. Tenji added that his men could not produce individual protections that were common for merchant sailors to carry around because their protection was the American flag flying from atop the vessel. Tenji informed the British, in effect, that while they might have the power to stop merchant ships and seize any men they wanted off of them, a ship of the United States Navy was different because a ship of the United States Navy represented the United States government, it represented the United States people, and it carried all the rights of self-defense uh, that any other nation's naval vessels could expect. Uh, the British left Tenji empty-handed, and afterwards he called all hands on deck and reiterated that not one of them would be taken unless the British first slew him in combat. He received a rousing three cheers from his crew and praise from the President of the United States. 
Now, 10G displayed, clearly displayed the character traits that Stoddart believed America's naval officers needed to have. But without question, Stoddart's favorite officer among his entire corps was Thomas Truxton. Uh, Truxton had been a successful privateer during the American Revolution. He had clearly shown his skill in, in uh, sea combat and seamanship, and so he was awarded a commission as soon as the United States created a navy in 1794. Um, interestingly enough, he was the only one of the original six captains who were commissioned that had not had experience in the Continental Navy. He had served out the American Revolution purely in his capacity as a privateer, and yet he would go on to become one of the nation's first war heroes. Stoddart, uh, excuse me, Truxton fully understood Stoddart's attitude toward British impressment of American seamen. He had one of his subordinate officers placed under arrest and jailed for allowing one sailor to be taken by a British press gang. And he also relentlessly disciplined his subordinate officers and crew, insisting on the highest level of performance from them. And that relentless discipline did not always sit well with the crew. He had plenty of complaints from his sailors. He had plenty of complaints from his junior officers. But it paid off in the long run when uh, Stoddart's ship, the Constellation, became the first vessel to, first United States ship to capture an enemy vessel in combat when he won a victory over the French frigate Le Insurgent. And I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation of that, but he captured a French frigate. And Truxton did not serve his country and he did not achieve these things in order to get rich. He, uh, he did it to perform great deeds that would outlive him. He rhetorically asked one of his brother officers, does any man enter into naval service for the sake of subsistence? And the answer to him was perfectly obvious. Are not glory and fame the grand incentives? He possessed tremendous courage in battle and zeal in pursuing the enemy. In part, that was part of his own personal desire for fame and honor. But he also took America's international standing very seriously. He boasted to one French officer, America, though a young nation, has arrived to manhood, and having already fought for that independence which she now possesses, will maintain it forever untarnished against all of Europe. Truxton's zeal had a darker side, though. Uh, he publicly took President Adams to task for some of his wartime policies, which as a commissioned naval officer he had no business commenting on. Uh, in his report on the capture of the French frigate, he added that the, uh, the French captain warned him that he had started a war. And he told Stoddart that his response to this was, if so, I am glad of it, for I detest a thing done by halves which was a thinly veiled critique of John Adams' decision to keep the war undeclared and to keep the quasi-war a quasi-war. Uh, in the euphoria of victory, Stoddard and Adams overlooked this blatant violation of protocol and allowed Truxton to bask in the glory of his victory. But Stoddard soon faced an even greater crisis with Thomas Truxton. So again, Truxton received his commission in 1794 at the same time that Congress voted to create a Navy. Uh, five other men were commissioned as captains. And two of those men, Richard Dale and Silas Talbot, actually ranked ahead of Thomas Truxton on the, uh, the seniority list. Uh, however, Dale and Talbot had been thrown into limbo when construction on the ships they were to command had been canceled. And so they were not officially, formally released from the Navy. However, they did stop getting paid. They did go out and find other jobs. And for the next three years, they uh, served in other capacities outside of the Naval service until the quasi-war ramped up and they were recalled to service. And so this created kind of a murky situation do Dale and Talbot come in at the same level of relative rank that they had with their initial commissions? Or would they come in ranked behind Truxton, who after all had been serving with the Navy and had become a war hero in their absence? It was a murky question, and it was a serious question for officers with a hypersensitive sense of honor and reputation. Uh, Stoddart knew it was going to be difficult, he hoped not impossible, to keep any of the three officers from resigning in protest. 
He reported to Adams, Talbot and Dale contend for the rank given them by first appointment in 1794, and without obtaining it, I fear neither will continue in the service. However, if they do not obtain it, I fear Truxton, a man of equal merit, will not. In other words, Truxton will resign if he's not allowed to stay ahead of Dale and Talbot. For his part, Stoddart believed that Dale and Talbot's time away had moved them below Truxton in relative rank, and he informed both men of this decision, and also noted to both men that he had, he had talked to the rest of the cabinet, the rest of the cabinet backed him, and agreed that yes, Truxton is now senior. Um, that did not satisfy either of them. Richard Dale threatened to resign. Stoddart managed to coax him back into the service, but as a sort of display of his irritation, Dale demanded permission to go on a lengthy merchant cruise, despite the fact that the nation was at war. Stoddart granted him permission for that, probably because Dale would have resigned from the service if he hadn't. Uh, Talbot was another matter entirely. Stoddart begged Talbot throughout the summer of 1799 to accept a commission as the fifth captain in seniority behind Truxton, and he repeatedly promised Talbot that he would make sure and send he and Truxton to opposite ends of the globe so they would never actually encounter each other in practice. The issue of relative rank would never actually come up. It would just purely be something that existed on paper. Talbot refused to budge. Uh, Talbot reached out to Alexander Hamilton and Henry Knox, two members of Washington's staff during the Revolutionary War, and asked them to use their clout to get him moved ahead of Truxton in seniority. Uh, when that didn't work, he went over Stoddart's head and went directly to President John Adams to plead his case. Uh, he also pulled out another trump card in pleading his case with Adams. He threatened to resign his commission if he was not moved ahead of Truxton. This would have been a disaster for the country, actually, because Talbot was uh, scheduled to assume command of another frigate, expected to take that frigate out on a cruise with a squadron to protect vulnerable American commerce. If he had resigned his commission and another captain had had to be found for the Constitution, it would have completely deranged uh, Stoddart's war plans. And whether solely because of his threat to resign or genuinely convinced that Talbot's Revolutionary War record entitled him to a uh, commission at higher rank, Adams caved. He agreed to move Talbot ahead of Thomas Truxton in relative rank. And to no one's surprise, Truxton immediately turned in his own resignation. Uh, in speaking to the crew of the Constellation, Truxton said, it as little becomes my character to yield my rank against what I think a well-founded right as it would to yield my ship to an enemy unequal in force. Therefore, I have thought it proper to quit. Truxton did not, however, fade quietly into the sunset. Uh, one other officer in the Navy was initially dismayed to hear that Truxton had resigned, but was reassured when he saw in today's paper that Truxton will still act as his own trumpeter. And Truxton's quite sympathetic biographer uh, quotes that, that officer and then followed it up with, Truxton might more aptly have been likened to a full brass band. Uh, despite resigning from the Navy, he made sure that everyone knew his side of the story, uh, and he complained to anyone who would listen about the shabby treatment that he had received and how the Navy did not appreciate his great contributions. And then he went back to his home in Perth Amboy, New Jersey to simmer for a while. After he left, Stoddart groused to Alexander Hamilton, this avarice of rank in the infancy of our service is the devil. But however frustrating Talbot and Truxton's conduct might have been, uh, the infant Navy had a limited number of experienced and successful captains, and none was more successful than Truxton. And so Stoddart reached the conclusion that the service simply could not afford to lose Thomas Truxton. Upon receiving the irate captain's letter of resignation, Stoddart talked it over with Adams. And they both decided to ignore it and wait for Truxton's temper to cool before launching a campaign to entice him back into the service. 
Uh, they wrote pleading letters to him, and somehow they also convinced George Washington to personally invite Truxton out to Mount Vernon and for the father of his country to make a pitch for why Truxton should return to service and continue to serve his country. Uh, whether he was bored with civilian life, whether he genuinely believed the country could not do without him, or whether he was genuinely moved by their pleas or some combination of all three, Truxton eventually caved and agreed to return to the Navy, but only after securing a promise from Stoddart that he and Talbot would never be anywhere close to each other while at sea, and so he would never be placed in the humiliating position of having to accept orders from Talbot. This Stoddart granted. Now, Benjamin Stoddart was not a weak man. Uh, you can just ask Isaac Phillips. And Benjamin Stoddart was also not a man who uh, devalued the importance of civilian control of the military. Stoddart repeatedly noted in his writings the importance of civilian control, the importance of the Secretary of the Navy, and beyond that, the President of the United States, having absolute authority over military forces. Uh, and Stoddard eventually did rebuke Thomas Truxton, not for the resignation episode, but later, for a variety of reasons, Thomas Truxton took to signing his letters Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces of the United States and began issuing orders to ships that were outside of his squadron, and Stoddard finally stepped in and quashed that and said, no, no, you are still under the orders of the Navy Department, and the Navy Department still gets to tell other ships where to go. <clears throat> but even after that episode, uh, Truxton found his way back into Stoddart's good graces. And the simple fact is that Stoddart, um, Stoddart was facing a problem that every leader eventually has to deal with, and that is managing difficult subordinates. And uh, the fact was that the United States had no long-standing naval tradition for throughout the colonial era. It had enjoyed the protection of the Royal Navy. The United States had no naval academy. The United States had no ready-made set of officers to work with. It had to work with what it had, and it had a very, very limited number of fighting captains to work with. Truxton, Dale, Talbot, these were men that embodied the qualities that Stoddart needed. Uh, in order to secure the reputation and secure the practical independence of the United States. Yes, the United States had declared its independence, but Britain still felt free to stop U.S. naval vessels and steal sailors off of them. France still felt entitled to dictate foreign policy to the United States. It took officers in the mold of Thomas Truxton to demonstrate to Europe that the United States was a real country, that de demanded the respect of its peer nations. And for that reason, Stoddart had to deal with the sometimes egregious insubordination that he faced from some of the officers that he most uh, appreciated. Uh, thanks in large measure, though, to Stoddart's careful cultivation of the first officer corps, the United States did not find it necessary to burn all of its ships, as he has, had feared at the beginning of his tenure. Uh, Stoddart trained up a generation of naval officers who went on to perform great deeds for the United States, first in the Quasi War, then in the First Tripolitan War in uh, the Mediterranean, and eventually going head to head with the Royal Navy itself in the War of 1812. The United States also, in that same period, developed a new conception of duty that de-emphasized the idea of personal honor and that placed a much heavier emphasis on the idea of subordination to the chain of command and complete and total subordination to civilian control. And both of those developments were a direct product of the men that Stoddart chose and that Stoddart elevated to positions of command in the early United States Navy. Stoddart was a huge factor in why the Navy uh, secured respect and secured a claim for the American Republic long after he had returned to private life. And so for that reason, Stoddart deserves the, the acclaim that he receives among naval historians for his crucial and really indispensable part in establishing the United States Navy and setting it on the trajectory that extends even to the present day 
of securing the interests and securing the reputation of the United States of America. Thank you very much. And so at this time, I'm happy to field any questions that folks may have. Yes. Um, so uh, you're talking about how you know this this personal drama and difficulty in controlling these folks like causes the Navy to start like sort of rethinking how to you know create a media officer. Yeah. It. I would say the turning point actually came not long after Stoddart left office. Uh, so Stoddart, I focus mostly on captains in this presentation, but obviously he also chose midshipmen and lieutenants. And so the next Secretary of the Navy, Robert Smith, did not run into the same problem Stoddart had of, we only have so many captains, some of them are kind of, kind of useless, so the ones that are good fighters we have to put up with. There was a much bigger pool of officers to draw from for future secretaries of the Navy. And so for that reason, they did not have to choose between fighting captains and subordinate captains. They could find officers who were both zealous and subordinate. Um, and in fact, the, the next secretary of the Navy ran into the same problem with Truxton that Stoddart did of Truxton turning in his resignation if he couldn't get his way. And Robert Smith, straight up told him, well, sorry to see you go, but best of luck in your future endeavors. So there was not the, uh, the renewed campaign to beg Truxton to come back. And that wasn't because Robert Smith, Stoddart's successor, had a completely different idea of what makes a, a good naval officer. That was because Robert Smith had more captains to choose from than Stoddart had. Yes? How did Stoddart go about making the decisions to remove people? In other words, was it a unilateral decision in his research to come across any kind of evidence that he second guessed himself, but you know, kind of a bit of a leadership takeaway to this? But to make a difficult decision, I'm going to fire somebody like mm -hmm. it's just my own judgment, and then, oh, I made a mistake. Uh, uh, I have never encountered Stoddart second guessing himself, actually. He seemed very, very confident on what kind of naval officers he wanted and who didn't make the cut. Um, in terms of the decision, obviously John Adams as the president had the final decision. And Stoddart and Adams had a very, very close working relationship. Uh, they very much trusted each other. And so a lot of times they're writing with one voice. So when Stoddart sends a letter to a naval officer, you know, maybe he's directly speaking what the president had conveyed to him. Maybe he's speaking in his own voice. Adams and Stoddart really spoke with one voice on a lot of these issues. They were very much of the same mindset. And so uh, with Isaac Phillips, the, the example I gave of, uh, of a captain who was summarily dismissed. Um, later on, when, uh, when Stoddart was writing to another correspondent, I forget who, about the whole situation and said, you know, Isaac Phillips is complaining about it and he's complaining that the president mistreated him. And, he needs to know that the president acted on my recommendation. I was 100% for kicking him out of the Navy, and Adams agreed with me. And so in a lot of cases, it was the same thing. Uh, the only place, actually the only place that I've ever come across of Adams and Stoddart not being on the same page was with Silas Talbot. Uh, Stoddart wanted to rank Truxton ahead, and Adams eventually overruled him and put Silas Talbot ahead of Truxton. But that's the only example I could find. Yes. As a start, it's an emphasis on personal honor and the trait mm -hmm. of seeing and developing officers. Does he uh, discuss or have any views on the duel within the Navy? I haven't come across uh, much of him talking about that. Dueling tended to be a bigger issue in the Tripolitan War uh, when ships were away for extended cruises in the Mediterranean. Um, it was not as much of an issue in Stoddart's tenure. I would imagine, though, just given Stoddart's handling of every other situation that comes up in this regard, that he would have accepted dueling as a, as a necessary evil. 
Uh, and certainly his successor is viewed at the same way of, yes, it's a problem when promising young officers kill each other on the field of honor, but just given the, given the, uh, the zeitgeist of the time, and especially given the type of men that they wanted in positions of command, there was nothing they could do about it. Yeah, I think there was a... Excellent. Um, I was really curious. What struck me as particularly interesting was the close relationship between President Adams and his daughter. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's typical of like the Secretary of the Navy, President Perry, later on as well? Uh, it was certainly true of Robert Smith and Thomas Jefferson, uh, the next President and Secretary of the Navy. James Madison, um, less so. James Madison tended to take less interest in naval affairs than, than Adams and Jefferson had, and so secretaries of the Navy had a little bit more of a free hand. And then Paul Hamilton, uh, Madison's first secretary of the Navy, sort of fine in peacetime, but was simply not up to administering a wartime Navy when the War of 1812 broke out. And so Madison extracted a resignation from him and, and Pass the baton on to uh, to William Jones, who uh, again had a lot more room to act autonomously, just because Madison took less interest in the Navy Department, um, but certainly had Madison's wholehearted approval for his leadership. So, generally speaking, in this period, you had good working relations between the Secretary of the Navy and the President. Yes. Could you discuss the original source materials that are available that you use? Because uh, obviously you're specifically referring to uh, observations or views of Stoddard and others during that period. What's the, what kind of information is, was actually available uh, to give you a direct insight in terms of what sure. these views are? Uh, there is a lot of information available, actually. Um, so uh, in the early, late 1930s, I believe, as part of the uh, Public Works Administration, the, um, the US government published naval documents relating to the quasi-war with France. So it's seven volumes of four, five, six hundred pages a piece, a piece that are just transcripts of all of the correspondence from the archives relating to the quasi-war. So all of Stoddart's letters to his officer corps, all of John Adams' letters relating to the quasi-war, uh, really a treasure trove of information. And then for the, uh, for the Barbary Wars, you have the same thing. I think the Barbary Wars is also six or seven volumes. Um, so that, is, that was certainly a massive help for me in terms of uh, this project, because I didn't have to decipher Stoddart's handwriting and all of, the, uh, all of these captains' handwriting myself. I had nice typed transcripts of it. Um, but you also do have, if you go over to National Archives, just rows and rows and rows of microfilm reels with copies of all of the incoming and outgoing correspondence of the Secretary of the Navy. So that's really the key resource. And then also, Library of Congress has the personal papers of several of these uh, naval officers. Uh, I think the Historical Society of Pennsylvania has several boxes of personal papers of Thomas Truxton, so I pulled a couple of quotes from those. So the, the sources are out there and readily available. Um, it was certainly uh, not, not a challenging project to find information on, to find resources for. So it's, it's just as an aside, in answer to that question also, here in Nimitz Library, all of those volumes of the quasi-war documentary history and the Barbary War documentary history, there are multiple copies of them upstairs in the stacks. Record Group 45 with the SECNAV's correspondence, letters to and from, all that microfilm that's at NARA. Much of it is also downstairs in the basement in the microfilm collection. And one final online resource that's available is called Founders Online, which is from the Library of Congress, uh, in which they have digitized an enormous amount of the personal and government correspondence of the founding fathers, quote unquote. Um, and so you can find a lot, if, you look, if you're looking for a president's relationship with their SECNAV, all that correspondence between them is available within those digital databases also. So as, as Dr. Shepard pointed out, there is a massive primary source base available for this era, and much of it is right here in Nimitz Library. Yes, uh, to, to echo that, I'm glad you brought that up. It reminds me of there was actually a, um, 
the papers of Thomas Jefferson are available in the Founders Online, and I actually, um, in writing the, the next chapter that came after this one in my book project, I found a last minute quote from Jefferson where he had been corresponding about Truxton's second resignation from the Navy and what to do about that, and Jefferson said in so many words, good riddance, we don't want him back. So uh, really nice find there. So yeah, Founders Online, and actually, I. I Pretty sure the naval documents of the Quasi War and naval documents of the Barbary Wars can also be found online as well. So the the information the uh, internet is just becoming a treasure trove of information for researching projects from this era. Yes. Yes, uh, Stoddart very much saw that as part of a captain's responsibility. So if you're a captain of a ship, your job is to pick out the midshipmen who are good candidates for promotion, and your job is to pick out the midshipmen who need to go. Um, I recall one, uh, one captain, Edward Preble, who just would write out letters of resignation, call midshipmen into his office, and hand them and say, here, sign at the bottom of this. <laughs> so it was very much seen as the captain's responsibility. To, uh, to purge the junior officer corps of those who were, who were not fit to hold a commission or to give second chances. I mean, there were cases where there were discipline issues with midshipmen and with even lieutenants that Stoddart kind of felt like, you know, this guy needs to go, but if the captain went to bat for him and said, no, I think he needs another chance, Stoddart would grant it. So he, he trusted his captains in that regard. Yes? Yes, uh, so the Naval Academy came a few years after my book project ends, so I haven't dug into it as, in as much detail as the very early Republic. Uh, Robert, yes, Robert Smith, uh, Stoddart's successor, eventually did create a, uh, a formal examination process to get promoted from midshipman to lieutenant, and obviously he was entrusted to the existing officer corps to administer that, that examination, and so it did become a bit more formalized under Robert Smith, but again, Stoddart, is, he has no officer corps, so he has to build it from scratch while fighting a war. Uh, he simply didn't have time to develop a formal process. He, he had to lean more heavily on his captains. Yes? Sir, do you think that Stoddart's emphasis on zeal and pride and bravery were him seeing this as something that was needed in officer corps? at this specific time, or do you think these were values that he would have wanted to see in the Navy regardless of U.S. global setting? Like for example, if he were the Secretary of the Navy for Great Britain, do you think he would have sought out the same kinds of officers, or would he have had a different stance? Uh, to a degree, these were always qualities that officers were going to be needed. These were always qualities that would be needed in naval officers. Um, the, the distinction with Stoddart is the things he was willing to put up with from officers who displayed these qualities. So the Royal Navy, yes, the Royal Navy wanted officers with zeal, officers with courage and bravery, officers with a sense of honor, but the, uh, the situation with Silas Talbot and Richard Dale and Thomas Truxton and, well, if we give in to these guys, this one's going to resign, we give in, these are going to, that never would have been tolerated in the Royal Navy. Um, and so, and then also issues with even with Stoddart successors and dueling, um, and issues with just rather blatant insubordination at times. This was this was a necessary evil that Stoddart was willing to tolerate because he valued so much securing the United States reputation. Whereas when time went on, obviously zeal, industriousness, bravery, those qualities are all still absolutely demanded of naval officers, but there's less of a willingness to tolerate insubordination. So Stoddart prized those qualities. Stoddart was forced to choose between those qualities and respect for the chain of command to a degree that his successors were not. All right, I want to thank everybody for coming today. We're, we're out of time. We need to let the midshipmen get off to class. Uh, one last final thank you to the Stockdale Center for partnering with us on this, to William Stutt from the class of 49, who uh, financially supports the first Bell Lecture Series, 
Um, and I want to thank you all for coming. And keep your eyes on your emails for the announcements of our further First Bell lectures the rest of this semester. So join me in thanking Dr. Shepard. <laughs>